Until I met my teacher, my existence lie frozen in the peaks and crags of my limited self. Like a summer sun, my teacher moved across my cold, inert world with an invitation to an adventure beyond shady crevasses. I began to respond to the luminous warmth of my teacher until that which was solid released itself to the fluid aliveness of water. And I began to flow, moving upon the land, leaning in the direction of my source, touching and being touched all along the journey home. This is consciousness fused with form. So whatever form happens to come up in your body-mind, consciousness concludes, that's me. This is better known as suffering. <laughs> Good morning. It's great to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be here. Looking nice. forward to sharing uh, some some of this spiritual stuff with you and see what we come up with. I look forward to it. All right. Um, I'd like you to compare Dharma to Karma. Dharma to Karma. As you know it, as you understand <laughs> it. <laughs> yeah. Dharma to me is truth. That's to me is truth. Is Dharma. Karma, conditioning. Karma is confusion. Karma is illusion. Collected illusion, collected ideas, collected views and opinions from a lifetime. And the Dharma is the truth that's right inside of that. The truth that's inside of the Karma. The living seed of truth that's always right there, even in the midst of the Karma. Is it, but both have to do with our actions in the world, yes? Is it? Well, they both display themselves as action. Hmm? Mm -hmm. So karma is just ultimately a tendency. It doesn't start out being an action, it's a tendency toward action. A tendency towards thought patterns, and a tendency towards patterns of emotion, a tendency towards reactiveness of body, of mind, of feeling. This is, this is karma in its, in its sense. Karma being the conditioning. Of course, as a life, as a human being, this, this turns into action, doesn't it? This tendency turns into thought and feeling, and then thought and feeling turn into physical action, relationship. And in the same way, dharma, which is the truth of who we are, the truth period, Dharma being peace, Dharma being truly awake. This awakeness, this true Dharma of being, also displays itself through us. It, the truth also expresses itself when we realize the truth of our being. Then this truth gets expressed, lived out, acted. So when there's some intelligence that comes into us, then we start to see that I must not be simply what I think about myself. I must not be simply what I think about myself. And this in itself, this is a revolution. This is the beginning of a revolution. That I'm not really merely what I think about myself. It's a simple statement, isn't it? I'm sure probably most of the people in this world, in this world certainly in this room, have heard such a statement before. And yet, most human beings in our culture spend an endless amount of time and energy trying to have better thoughts about themselves. When really it doesn't take a whole lot to actually look and we start to see that I'm not whatever I think about myself. It's just thought. Whatever you think about yourself disappears when you stop thinking. You ever notice? 
It just, it's gone. You think you're a great person? It's gone if you're not thinking, boy, I'm a great person. <laughs> you think you're really kind of a rotten scoundrel? And as long as you're not thinking that, it's gone. You don't go from rotten to good. It's just gone. You're not even good. Not even bad. We think these things into into existence and then consciousness, which is so fused with form, believes it. I've heard you talk about integrity. <clears throat> and when I hear you talking about dharma relative to karma, I think of a certain integrity of listening before we act. That's it. This is the only way to get to the truth of our being, to the true dharma, to the true truth of what we are, is a deep, deep listening. First, the, when we listen, there's often the, the karma, conditioned ideas and views and feelings and all of this. This is the collected confusion of a lifetime. Right? The collective resistance to what is or what has been. And in the willingness to, to listen and to question, is this really true? Is this really who I am? Is this karmic created self really who I am? The only way to find the answer to that was with this very deep state of listening. So we're actually touching into something that's deeper than conditioned self. This listening is essential. This stopping the movement, stopping within the movement of karma to listen, to listen to what we are, to listen to the stillness of who we are. This is essential. And this quality of listening, it's not just the mind that's listening. Is it the body? What is... It's the whole being. The whole being it comes into a state of listening. From, of course, listening is also becoming deeply conscious. When we listen, we become deeply conscious. So listening is an openness of mind. It's not so much an activity of mind that the mind is going to listen. It's an openness of mind. It's a relaxation of mind. An open, a listening on the level of emotion is not we're listening for a particular emotion, listening for a feeling state or a sensation, but the emotional body is opening itself so it can feel. Feel that which is beyond feeling ultimately. And then consciousness itself, that which is deeper than thought, deeper than feeling, is a deep, a deep listening. You know? Listening to that which can't be spoken. But when we see that this center of our own self, the center of our own being, the center of our own sense of I, cannot be defined by the thought forms or feeling forms or forms of ideology, forms of body, forms of mind, forms of identity. That the, the, the I itself, that which is constantly awake, can come out of being fused with form. And it's this consciousness that, wake, that becomes conscious of itself. In the New Testament, after healing miracles, the healed would often offer gratitude to Christ, and he often would reply, Thy faith has made thee whole. Yes. Can you speak to that? Mm. Well, faith is always what makes us whole. If we understand faith to be a total trust, an absolute trust, because this is really what the Christ within, or what the the embodiment of Christ called Jesus was was really doing, a being which is so transparent to that truth, to the Christ within, just emanating that, right? And in another, in someone who's sick, whether it's physically sick, emotionally sick, whatever, that becomes so powerful that that person has to listen. They are stopped. The sick is the person is stopped. 
And in that stopping, that stopping is, that's the true faith, is stopping, listening. Then something can happen, you see. Then healing can happen. An awakening can happen. A healing can happen in that space of total trust, total willingness to be still, be quiet. You see? And Jesus was a, was a transmitter of that faith. You know what I mean? He would say with such confidence, and it wasn't just the words that he was speaking, it was what he was emanating, right? He would look at somebody and he would say, You are healed. Stand up. You are healed. Stand up. This absolute oneness with the truth, this absolute confidence, this is, the, this is true faith that was so powerful. Do you see that the person that he was talking to couldn't deny it, could not deny it within themselves. It would wake it up within the person. You see, and that's, to me, this is what he, he was embodiment of, this true trust, true faith, and absolute confidence. You know, he had no doubt whatsoever. When he said, you're healed, he knew you're healed. He knew it. And if you know it, it will be so. Who we are is not limited to any state, to any form, to any thought form or feeling form. Even as they're happening, because that's life. They just happen. That's life. That, that brings up in me that some experiences with other teachers that use group energetics or other methods of, of and have affected healing within people that are in healing crisis. Cancer is going to remission within 24 hours. But oftentimes they come back. That's right. Because They do come back, as you said. They often come back. Because still, nobody has the power over anybody. See, you come into the, the energy field of somebody else, you can temporarily resonate with that energy field, it can awaken that up in you, and in that moment you may actually be healed. You may actually go into remission. Physical healing, emotional healing, psychological healing, ultimately the deepest healing, which is a healing yourself right out of a separate self. An awakening to that. But of course, since nobody ultimately has power over another human being, no being has power. Jesus didn't have power over another human being. That that human being is ultimately left to their own devices. They're left to themselves. Either they have the true faith, either they have seen the truth themselves clearly, or they haven't. If they haven't, if they haven't the truth within themselves, if they haven't found it, if they haven't found that true faith, which is a total surrender, then when they're out of the energy field of a very, say, powerful being, then they're going to revert back to their old familiar state. So you see that, you know, someone hops up out of the wheelchair and, and they're dancing. At that, they're actually healed because a minute ago they actually could not do that. So at that moment there's actually healing. But is there a tra- has, been, has there been a turnaround at the very seat of consciousness, at the very seat of their deepest, deepest self, at their heart? If there has, that healing will be permanent. If there's not, that healing will be temporary. The trick is, is to come back into your renta body without getting fused in form again. It's a bit like taking an alcoholic who's been dry for a week and saying, great, you're going to live the rest of your life in a bar. <laughs> and oftentimes, again, he would say, after the healing, um, go thy way and sin no more. Yes. In other words, remain in this consciousness. That's right. That's right. You see, because sin is not really what, what we take it to be, you know, as some evil doing. Sin is ultimately a state of confusion about what's true. Right? Repentance is actually, really means to turn around. To repent is to turn around. Right? So to repent from sin is to turn around. You're going one way. But you realize, no, that's not true. 
It's not that going that way is bad. It's not true. So when he says, sin no more, he's saying, stay in the truth. It's not a moral, it's not a moral imperative, don't sin. It's saying, stay in the truth. Don't lie to yourself, to yourself. Right? Turn around at each moment. That's the repenting. It's not a shameful thing. It's just a turn around in your heart. But so of course, of course he would say that to him, wouldn't it? Go, go and sin no more. Because he knows. If you go and sin, which simply means if you reconfuse yourself, re-identify, then the healing will reverse itself. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes worse, come back harder. You it may, it very well may. Yeah. It very well may. That's right. That's right. So I want to uh, switch gears. The void that people, the my teachers talk about. The oh void. yes. It's not really empty, is it? What's that? It's not really empty, is well, it? Well, in one sense, in one sense it isn't, but in one sense it is. So when I talk about the void, I think it's the place where people ultimately we have to deal with the void. The emptiness, but emptiness means it's empty of our idea of emptiness. Because mm. as soon as you have emptiness comes to mind, it's almost an image of emptiness, doesn't it? Of lack, of nothing. But the void is actually empty of that image too. You see, the, the void is really letting ourselves go, our separate self go, and we sink into the mystery of our being, into a place that's totally dark. Totally dark because it's a total mystery. Everything we learned, everything we know, everything we hoped and believed and wanted, and we all, we're finally, at a point of grace, are willing to go into that void, into that darkness, into that total unknown. Mm-hmm. When we let go into that completely, then we can awaken as that, as the void, as that pure potential. When we awake as the void, then the void is finally not scary because we're not in relationship with the void, not a separate me who's afraid of the void. We've seen our true nature and it is the void itself. It is emptiness. But this, then the emptiness is seen and experienced to be who we are. Then it is actually full of the potential of everything that will ever be. And this is the fullness within the void. Your true nature is that formless essence and it's just showing itself up in all these ways through all these forms. But it's the same thing. Same essence. And that essence is discovered in silence. Not so much by you trying to be silent, but realizing in the silence that you are the silence itself. You see that it has the potential to create itself into anything and everything, into this whole universe. This universe is the void. Do you see what I mean? Yes. It's not that just the empty thing. When you look at the tree, you're actually looking at what the void has presented itself as. When you look at in the mirror and you see that face of yours, that's what the void has presented itself as. And there it is looking through those eyes, looking at itself. This is the void. And what's the common thread that you that does not disappear doesn't go away in the void out of the void manifestation in the whole circle is there a common thread and i know we're talking in concepts but in words but 
the common thread that's through all of it is that which can't be spoken. If you were to speak, I, uh, I mean, I think, I mean, for sometimes a word like love, I think, it's not love. So you can say what it's not, but you... I can say what it's not. You can name anything, and I can say, that is that is precisely and exactly what it's not. Everything that can be named, that is not what is eternally present. Everything that can be named. Any concept. The best concepts. Even the concepts that I myself use to point to that. Like the void, emptiness, consciousness, awareness, spirit, the self, the no-self... All of them point to that which can't be spoken. This, this awakeness. This that is awake. And we can't say what this is because this isn't a what. It's not a thing. This that is awake. That's the thread? That's the thread. That is the threat. Always, 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 there is consciousness of everything. Never gets annihilated, never changed. Self-consciousness gets annihilated, certainly. But the awakeness within... That's right. ...does not. That's right. You see, ultimately, at death, all sense of self-consciousness will be annihilated, gone, dispersed, back into its true nature, into pure consciousness into pure spirit with no sense of self only a sense of itself very confusing for the mind to figure out you see what is there to figure out about nothing about something that's literally nothing there's nothing to figure out except it helps to figure out that there's nothing to figure out Aja, is is awakeness a black and white issue? Are you either awake or you're not? Are there is there a gray area? Are there a matter of degree? And if there is, can you see this degree of realization in students that come to you or people that you meet? Of course, both are true. That you're either awake or you're not. So this there's a truth to that. That either you're dreaming or you dream of separation, or you're not. You're awake. One or the other. Now, if you're awake, you may not, you may be groggy, you know, hazy, very prone to fall back into the dream state. You know, when you wake up in the morning and those mornings where it takes a long time and you're laying in bed and you're kind of going in and out and in and out. When you're awake, you're awake. When you're dreaming, you're dreaming. It's still black and white, but you're so much on the, on the, the thread of that. That it's very easy, right? To be groggy, you become awake and then you sleep. Awake, this is possible. Right? This is very possible. This is where even so many people that have awakenings find themselves. Is in this in and out. Awake but groggy, which leads to asleep and separate. And then awake and groggy and back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. See, so both are actually have a truth to them. When we are finally awakened, really awakened, then we are awake to that awakeness which does not sleep, which cannot sleep, which has never slept, which has never gone back into separation. This is the true, true awakening. When consciousness comes out of its fusion of form, it wakes up to itself. It knows what it is. Not the me that is form, the me that's just thought. Because that's what me is. Me is thought. Me disappears as soon as you start stop thinking about me. That me doesn't wake up. You know the me that thinks it's going to become enlightened? Forget it. That me is toast. <laughs> See, it's not. It's that awakening that cannot go back to sleep. That brings to mind another quote from the New Testament: "The foxes have their holes, the birds have their nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head." That's right. That's right. Nowhere to rest your head, because you you are eternally always awake. Eternally always awake. 
So while that sounds sort of like not very nice to not have a place to rest your it's head. It's not nice to the separate self. It's the separate self's whore. No place to rest my head. The separate self wants enlightenment to be a place to finally rest my head. There is no place for the separate self to rest its head. Enlightenment is a disaster to the separate self. <laughs> you see, lots of spiritual experiences are very nice to the separate self. It collects them. I merged with all things. I saw the white light. I, you know, whatever it is. I had unity consciousness. And it likes collecting all these nice experiences and hopes. One day, one of these experiences would be permanent. But I have nowhere to rest my head. That's the truth. Nowhere. There's nowhere to rest. There's nothing to grab hold on. There's nothing in this for the egoic self at all. You see what I mean? Nothing. But ultimately it is liberation. It's liberation, of course, because it's liberation from the separate self. Unfortunately, we've made the conceptual mind into our God. What I think is what is true. Instead of realizing that the conceptual mind is a beautiful and powerful tool when in the hands of a truth that's prior to the mind, then it's a beautiful tool. When the mind has been taken as the ultimate reality, well, just open your eyes. That's what happens. It's not a pretty sight. It it seems that there's um, a propensity in consciousness to move towards self-realization. Yes. Is this the closest thing we have to the meaning of life? (laughs) (laughs) If we were if we were talk, to talk about meaning of life at all, which which actually to the to consciousness itself, to what we really are, meaning doesn't mean anything. It doesn't even understand meaning or the search for meaning because everything is its own meaning. Every moment is its own meaning, its own flowering. That, but in a more relative way, from the relative consciousness. Of course, we could say that this is actually. Consciousness waking up to its true state through this whole humanness, through this whole being, through our whole being. Certainly, this seems to be what consciousness is trying to accomplish. This is really the spiritual urge. This is the desire for peace, for happiness, for completeness. Like returning home. That's right. But different from when you left. That's right. You do return home. Totally back home. But when you finally, when you leave home, when you leave your sense of who you are, when you spontaneously leave home, awaken to that which is beyond the home that you've known, then you have returned truly to home for the first time. That this that you are has no form, no shape, no gender, no ideas, no ideology, no belief system, no religion, no nothing. It's gone. All that's just conditioned thoughts, conditioned ideas. This is the great liberation. This is the great freedom. That the thing that we are, that every human being is searching for in many different ways actually sits in the center of their own being. That's why anytime we wake up, we, the first thing we wonder is, how on God's earth did I miss this? <laughs> and finally, I want to ask you one more thing. When I sit with you, when, I, when I'm in your presence, there's <clears throat> a sense of transparency all at once there is somebody personal there, yet there is this experience of of, of transparency. I don't know how else to put it. Mm-hmm. It's one of the things, maybe the primary thing, that led me to really trust 
your authenticity as as a teacher for me. Um, but it's confusing in a way. It seems paradoxical. And which part seems paradoxical? Well, here's a person, and yet yes, there's this transparent quality where, um, for instance, the yeah. the love that I feel for you is not personal. Yes. Um, um, any agitation I may have with you is not personal. Yes. It's yet there is a personal dynamic occurring here. Yes. This is a mystery, isn't it? Uh, yes. Right? Because that which is not really personal is also displaying itself as personal. As I sit here with you, there's obviously there's there's a personality here. Right? There's a personality structure here, there's a body structure, there's a mind structure. It, that's all here. It's all present. It's present in you, it's present in every human being. The, 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 key, the, the key, however, is when we really deeply have let go into what we are. The personality structure ultimately, ultimately, is emptied of its division, of its inner con- contradiction, its inter- inner um, struggle. And when, when our personality structure, our emotional structure, our intellectual structure is free of division, that gives that sense of great transparency. See, There's still a, a personality though, right? Every being has a personality. But as it's, as it's no longer confined by conflict inside, we feel that, that transparency, you see? And you start to feel it in yourself. The more you start to see through your own inner contradictions, you start to feel in yourself a transparency where this that is awake is operating through a personality, but very transparently. You know, it's not being distorted. Mm. It's not being distorted. And of course, there is a connectiveness, isn't there? There's an intimacy. Yes. There's a love that we both feel. That it's actually, that's the love when this is transparency comes upon the two of us. Then there's a beauty. But it's very sublime. It's very, yes. It's very sublime. It's very different than the, the ecstasies of, of passionate, personal, intimacy love. That's right. Um, that's right. It's a very deep, tender very intimate thing that can't really be we can speak about it can't we mm. but it can't really be directly put in words but it there there it is mm. very beautiful mm. that's right that's right this this truth it is in relationship with itself mm. you know, meeting itself that's sublime that's sublime to me that's what love is that's love. The other thing is love's imitator. You know, the butterflies in the stomach and, you know, it's me and you against the world, sweetheart. And, <laughs> you know, what? It, sure. that's nice. That's a celebration of life. There's nothing wrong with that. That's more like passion than love. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. And you know, when you've been with someone for a while, if there has been love, there's really been a connectedness of deep love that it's only this unspoken total sublime intimacy this is what sustains mm. the other comes and goes you know passion sometimes not so passion other times you know what I mean mm-hmm. worked up sometimes not worked up other times it's this sublime connectedness though that when we've surrendered to it that's it's what we are it's what the other is, and then that's what's in relation. Mm. Mm. And it's not personal. And also, there's at the same time, it's not personal. It has that quality of personalness in the sense that it's not separate or other than what we are. Mm. It's like a celebration of diversity without the loss of the sense of our oneness. Oh, this is beautiful. I couldn't have put it better myself. <laughs> Well, <laughs> that's it. That's it. Thank you, Roger. It's been great to be with you. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be with you too, Robert. Have a great flight home. Ah, thank you. It's wonderful talking with you.
good morning, Aja. It's good to see you. Thank you. Good morning, Marcy. Yeah, you... Thanks for spending some time with us here to clarify some of the spiritual uh, understanding that we need to maybe our, make our way along the path. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. Your most recent book is entitled, My Secret is Silence. Mm. Could you talk about this secret and does it help us to meditate? to approach this secret? Well, the silence itself really, it's sort of a play on words in a sense that silence really isn't a secret. Uh, I suppose to many people it is because it's always dismissed. It's not acknowledged. Noise is acknowledged, mental noise, emotional noise, but silence is so often not acknowledged. Mm -hmm. And so for most people it is a secret. And the truth of our being is silence. It is the silence. And so in that sense, that's why I call it my secret. But it's everybody's secret, actually. It's everybody's self. It's kind of one of those open secrets. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. right. It's so open that it's easy to miss. Mm -hmm. It's so obvious that it's easy to overlook. <laughs> one day I was looking through all the rooms of my house and in my car and everywhere looking for my sunglasses. With light eyes, you, you're really prone to, you know, bright light, you have to have sunglasses on all the time. At least I do. So I'm looking all over for my sunglasses and after about 45 minutes of scouring the house, scouring the car, looking everywhere, I finally go in and I ask my wife, sweetheart, I can't find my glasses anywhere. Have you seen them? And she just laughs at me and laughs and laughs and she points to the top of my head. <laughs> and I go, oh. This is, this is like, this is how awakening is. This isn't a matter of, of, of great knowledge, right? It's not it's sort of an Einstein-like insight. Right? It's more like a, a slight embarrassment that you actually missed it for so long. <laughs> Well, there's another concept that many spiritual teachings work with, and it's the concept of presence. Mm. And um, I'd like to know, what is presence? What are they speaking of? Presence would be, I suppose, the sense, the sense of silence, the kinesthetic feel of silence. Mm. Its presence is something that's not conceptual, that one... It's beyond a feeling, but in one sense, um, at the level of feeling or sensation, it's the sense of silence. Silence as a concept is just sort of almost like a lack, a lack of sound, a lack of noise, a lack of everything. But that kind of misses the point, too, because the true silence that's not conceptual, that's actual, that true silence is actually full of presence. It, one can feel it feel it in, in the room, one can feel it within yourself. So it's kind of the felt sense of silence. That's it, the felt sense of silence, right. The felt sense of what you really are, presence. But this that's awake is so close, so at hand, so what you are. It is what you are before you even think about it. It is what you were even before you were born. And it is what you will be when your body passes away. When the mind goes quiet, everything is there to be realized. Simply and immediately. Now, I'm wondering if it would be a, a kind of a stumbling block for some people to try to be present, you know, if it's that's, coming from the wrong place. It's a great stumbling block. Mm -hmm. Of course, we hear that in spirituality, don't we? Try to be present, be in the moment. 
all these are, are just are phrases that are hear, heard by the egoic mind, aren't they? So the egoic mind says, I'm going to try to be present. I'm going to try to be in the moment. Which is a dismissal of the underlying reality of experience, which is every experience unfolds within the moment. So as soon as the mind decides it's going to try to be in the moment, it's just confusing itself. In a sense, it's lying to itself because we're already in the moment. We can't possibly get out of the moment. So in one sense, being in the moment, if it's heard from the heart and not from the head, one starts to realize that there is only the moment. So there starts to be a conscious recognition that there is only the moment. There is only now. Regardless of what one is doing or thinking or saying, it's all taking place in the now. And so when the mind takes takes the spiritual directive to try to be in the moment, the mind has to dismiss the fact that you're actually in the moment, that you act, there's no other place you could actually be. And then the mind tries to be in the moment, tries to be more present, which is the mind superseding, overriding the reality, which is you are the moment. You are the whole of what's happening in any instant. Form looks for security even in spirituality, thinking, I'll just get my state to be constant, still searching for security, trying to get the impermanence to stop moving. Yes, and so there's a, an overlay on what is or this moment when we try to That's be right. present. There's a new assertion of me, the spiritual seeker, trying to follow out a spiritual instruction or dictate. When, when, when all it leads to is a vast amount of tail chasing, right? It, it actually fuels the very thing that true spirituality is trying to move beyond, beyond the, the limited self sense of me. And yet, so often the spiritual directives actually reinforce the sense of me, the me who is actually carrying them out, the me who's trying to be present. So this is a great... Um, stumbling block that many people get stuck in for years trying to perfect some technique we could say and as soon as we can look at this see the dilemma of consciousness being being fused with form and expecting happiness to come through thought form or feeling form See the limitation of seeking security in all these ways. When we can actually see that and not look away at all from our own experience, there's a natural sort of stopping. You don't even try to stop. There's a natural stopping. Yes, until the the mind seems to become so exhausted um, that that trying can let go. That's one way. (laughs) <laughs> that's one way. That's 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 the long path. Is the getting the mind to become so exhausted that it finally lets go. And it can and does get exhausted at some point if one actually tries hard enough and long enough the mind gets exhausted and then it lets go. But when it lets go so often one opens to a to a deeper truth, to a truth that's not of the mind, that's a truth that's not of the seeker, right? Not of the world of becoming and progress and All of that just stops because the mind gets exhausted. The emotional body gets exhausted. And so there's a stopping. There's an opening. But the problem becomes, because there wasn't a basic intelligence of how the mind functions, then very quickly the mind reestablishes itself and starts to wonder, how can I stay in this most beautiful state, in this most precious state? How can I do this? Which is a reestablishment. Right of the seeker, the little me, trying to maintain being in the moment, trying to maintain silence, trying to maintain something. So I call it the long path because when most people do go, go by the route of being exhausted and then they open or surrender. You see, but ultimately, as long as we're hooked into that, 
we're actually chained to the egoic state of mind and just exhausting it rather than from the very beginning seeing that every strategy that we try to move even the strategy to be in the moment is actually fueling our sense of separation you see so one one way is the long path which we're just following the illusion of the ego till it exhausts itself but it'll rest and then it'll come back or the the direct way is starting to have a certain deep insight into the nature of mind into the nature of egoic self and starting to see that every way it turns to become better free enlightened is itself feeding the illusion of its own separateness and most so many human beings think that this is so far away from them is so far away so far in the distance maybe i'll realize that someday but this is just a thought too sooner or later the mind will have to face its own powerlessness the egoic self will have to face its own powerlessness its own impotence in in the sense of its ability to come into the truth the egoic sense of self doesn't come into the truth it just opens itself sees beyond itself all the things that the that the egoic mind used to negotiate through life consciousness has none of it it doesn't move that way and to finally and completely open up into that is to let yourself go into emptiness just let go into emptiness and then something else moves something that doesn't move from an idea something that doesn't move from an ideology something that doesn't move from a belief system something that doesn't move from a point of view it just moves spontaneously without any distorting mental complex the mind can never figure this one out a wisdom of the mind rather than an exhaustion of the mind could you talk about that i would that? say it's it's wisdom of of awareness itself it's the mm-hmm. wisdom that comes from consciousness from observation without analyzing is because the mind's wisdom is always in the realm of analyzing what we see and we analyze from the standpoint of our own conditioning so our anal- our analyzing is corrupted by our own conditioning from the very beginning this sort of wisdom that i'm talking about is a wisdom that comes directly from the seat of consciousness from the seat of awareness when we're just watching so there is a watching without trying to manipulate anything without trying to change because that's the ego itself it witnesses it analyzes it takes what it analyzes and it tries to change itself that's feeding the illusion when i'm talking about wisdom it's something much deeper it's much more quiet it comes from this place which is still it comes from stillness itself that the stillness is not dead that it's actually aware that stillness is conscious and it's watching and wisdom just comes from that watching from that silence and it's not analyzed it's not used by the mind to implore or employ a better method it's just the wisdom that just arises and blooms and nothing's done with it you see because it's not from the mind it's from the deepest sense state of your own being it's from silence and it just the wisdom just blooms and there's and there's and the little self is not doing anything with it manipulating anything you see that's usually what happens as soon as something blooms the mind grabs it 
how can I use this to secure the future, to hold on to this wonderful spiritual state or to get rid of whatever, ego or thought or... But we're talking about something that's much deeper. You know, the softness of silence. The deep listening. And then what arises unfolds in its, of itself. And it has an effect throughout the body-mind that is unmanipulated, uncontrolled, unintended. This is, this, is the, this is really where transformation happens. That awakeness that's awake in everybody in this room, that awareness that's aware in everybody in this room, it's hearing my voice, that's the awakeness. We think of that as our possession. I, I am aware. It's not true though. The I... The me is just a thought. When you investigate, there is no I that's... It's just awareness is a war. Consciousness is conscious. No me behind it. No me within it. Consciousness is conscious. If you're more religious by nature, then you could say, Spirit is spirit. Me isn't. Me is never going to do it. Spirit is spirit. Consciousness is conscious. This is the great liberation. I'd like to go to um, this notion of the heart or pointing at what the heart is. Mm. Um, because many teachers speak of this and, and you use this term as well. Could you talk about what is the heart? Well, when I speak of the heart, I don't necessarily know what other people mean. Mm -hmm. But when I speak of the heart, it's that sense of a deep and complete openness. The heart of what you are. The heart of your own being. This isn't just sort of the heart that we're talked about. Sort of the the Valentine's heart. You know? (laughs) The heart that's that's displayed in, in movies and romance and this is not at all what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about the spiritual person, you know, singing praises to God and having their heart opened. I'm not even talking about a heart opening. I'm talking about something actually deeper than all of that. The, it is actually, the heart is another symbol, another pointer for the true state of consciousness, which is a total openness, a heartful openness, a deep intimacy and availability to, to what is. Something that, that doesn't contract. It's, it's, it's a non-verbal thing. It's even beyond um, feeling. This deep availability that consciousness is always has towards the present. Consciousness is deeply and always available to whatever is happening. This is what I re- this is what I mean when I refer to to the heart and the surrender to that to being what you are is immense. So in the true heart, these these two things, this total transcendence, a heart that's actually so wide and so vast that it includes everything and that which includes everything is also beyond everything so it's this sense of heart at the same time that it's totally intimate with everything that it transcends everything that consciousness is beyond it is also deeply in within the fabric it's not just beyond see that same beyondness is actually inside the fabric of the teeniest moment, inside the fabric of, of the simplest thought or the simplest feeling. So that's the, that's the deep intimacy. It's in the tree, it's in the leaf, and it's totally beyond. So it's, this is sort of, to the mind, it's contradictory to be totally beyond and totally within. And yet, since everything is one, Actually, consciousness 
um, the vastness that we are. It couldn't be any, any other way. So the fact that form changes and then movement is impermanence is actually life and death. That's its beauty. Without that, there's no life. This leads to the question then of what is what is going on with the mind in memory? What is it doing when it is living from memory? What is memory? Mm-hmm. Memory is the mind, the sense of self. So when I say mind, I'm actually meaning mind, body, emotion, feeling. This, but ultimately all that combined and to give one a sense of a separate self, a separate identity. There isn't one. There is, but it gives us a sense of self, and so therefore there's the conclusion that there is a separate self. So when the mind is always reflecting on itself, you ever notice? The mind is thinking about its thoughts. <laughs> it's thinking about its feelings. It's having feelings about its feelings. Right? So if, if a feeling of anger comes up, then you come, you, you start to be ashamed that you have anger. So you're feeling a feeling about your feelings. So this, this is always the sense of self-reflection, right? The mind and the emotional body is always reflecting on itself. This reflection is actually the movement of memory and interpretation. And this is how our sense of a separate self locates itself, finds itself through thinking about its thoughts, interpreting, having emotions that are interpreting other emotions, right? Because if one is not referencing oneself and literally creating yourself out of nothing, you see what I mean? That's it, right? When consciousness is fused with form, you're very, very extraordinarily vulnerable because all someone has to do is play with your thought form and they can turn your day from a good day into a rotten day. Someone can criticize you, and it changes your thought form. Right? You didn't do a good job. And your thought form goes, oh God, I didn't do a good job. All of a sudden, you have a rotten day. Very, very vulnerable to, to sudden and dramatic shifts in our whole way of being. <laughs> it's 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 stunning when you notice that as soon as you're not in thought there's no there's no yesterday is there there's there's no childhood there's no mommy there's no daddy nothing ever happened there's no proof that anything ever happened i'm not saying that nothing ever happened i'm simply saying that the only proof that anything ever happened is in the conceptual mind and even that's not proof. That's a, a symbolic representation that's happening in the present moment. You see what I mean? Because when we're not thinking, it's not there, is it? Hmm. And when we're not thinking about the future, the sense of separate self is not there. And then when we're not thinking in the present, when we're not referencing ourselves in the present moment, we as a separate somebody are not there. Then we start to see it's a fiction that's created by the mind referencing itself and feeling referencing itself and then there's a, and then we start to see a mystery because we see I'm not this separate self because there isn't one it's a flim flam show it's a sleight of hand right that's been taught we've learned it right <laughs> we've become very good at this sleight of hand magician's trick when we see that I'm not this separate self. Then there's a noticing that some there is still something that's present, you see. There is a noticing of that. There is total consciousness of seeing what we've just been talking about. See, there's something that notices that. That which notices is totally outside of what's being noticed. It's not caught in this whole self-referencing of thought and feeling complex. It's, it's free of it. It's not just outside, it's actually, as I was saying before, it's actually on the inside also. See, it's right in the middle of it, except that it's totally free of it. 
consciousness in its pure state doesn't even care that it's happening. You see? <laughs> so this to me is what I call memory. Memory is this, is this movement, this verb to self-reference. And keep on creating the separation. <coughs> That's what it does. Mm-hmm. 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 Yes. Right. It cre- keeps on creating a sense of separation, a separate self and a separate you. Mm-hmm. You know? But of course, enlightenment doesn't really have anything to do with the state. That's why it's called enlightenment. It has to do with waking up from states, from consciousness being fused in states. Not only really negative states of suffering, but also the very positive states. Also, also the very extremely positive states. Because if, if you're attached to the positive states, you will by nature be attached to the negative states. You can't have one without the other. When that separate self actually dissolves and life becomes spontaneous, and could you speak about what is truly living? What is life? <laughs> <laughs> life is life. You see, the living is living. This can't be put into concepts. It can't be... It can't really be answered directly in words because here we are. The living is living. Right? Life is living right now. It's speaking here through me. It's speaking as you. This is it. It's all spontaneously occurring. And so this is actually what we end up with, which is life just living. As well as uh, that state of consciousness which is beyond this thing called life living. It's, it's ever forever beyond it, but it's also forever within it. Right? It's also displaying itself as this spontaneous mm. movement of, of life. You see, that, that, that doesn't operate by a, 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 a mental construct. You know, spirituality has just butchered life, as everything else tends to do. But spirituality and religion actually has been often the, the, the most distorted butchers of what life really is, at least the way people hear it, because it becomes some mythological standard. But enlightenment is not an aha, because ahas are bound by the law of impermanence, right? Aha! And it's all great, and wow, this is going to solve every problem I've ever had, and I understand the nature of all the whole cosmos. And then three days later, you're looking back through your notebook and trying to understand what you read, what you wrote. <laughs> this is useless now. It solved all the problems of humanity three days ago, and now... <laughs> so we're not talking about even an insight that the mind needs to hold. It's not really an understanding. It's a, this that's always been there, this that is awake, that's awake in this moment. This simply realizes itself, as itself. It's not a knowledge thing. Because we're chasing a fantasy. Some ego's image, the way it would like to see itself, you see? An ego would love to see itself, you know, as the blinding white light, or the guru with the flowing robes, or, you know, God knows what. But that has nothing to do with it. At all. Life is, it's something that happens in the absence of all these images. Even the spiritual images, the beautiful images. Life is this beautiful movement. Consciousness in motion. That's what life is. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us. It's been great. Oh, you're so welcome. It's, it's great to talk with you. Yeah. Really great. Thank you. I bow to in you where the universe resides I honor the light within you Namaste Namaste 
so I don't know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Just say that and I'll say something. <laughs> I'll fill in the rest. Um, I've got some questions today. Am I supposed to? <laughs> I'm sort of throwing this one. It's like the phone machine. machine. <laughs> Let's go to lunch. <laughs> oh, that's a lot of fun. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're out of here. <laughs> okay. <laughs>